What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Cinema Royale. I'm John Nolan. I'm Trav Thompson. I never know if I'm supposed to introduce you or if I just like leave the opening and you take it. Sometimes so. you do, sometimes you don't. I don't yeah. know. I don't know either until until you actually just kind of stop talking like you did right then. Yeah. So. <laughs> we like to keep it uh, keep it um, unpredictable is what we like to do. So, what's up, that man? How's your week been? Thing. That is a good thing to be unpredictable about. Yeah. Absolutely. Don't want to get boring. Yeah. That How's your week been, man? <laughs> uh, it's okay so far. Yeah, you know, I was, I was, I've been playing Mass Effect two all day. So, um, and now I've got E three on in the corner over here. So, nah. busy with it right now. So, uh, anything major announced? I don't know. I, I can't tell with the big announcement anymore. <laughs> uh, I mean, seriously, I can't. Some people are excited yeah. for games they've never heard of, and uh, and a lot of these games I don't seem to have much interest in. But they, are, but I am looking at the. Halo Infinite trailer, which looks kind of interesting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't get on board with... Uh, yeah, I definitely know Halo, so... Right. Well, yeah, it's like a lot of people are really into Nintendo. Um, like the Switch, obviously, is huge. My brother, diehard Nintendo fan, plays the, the Mario games. I have a Switch. I just can't get into it. They're, like, all the games seem... I'm going to alienate some people, but childish. Like, it's, it's more, like, cartoony, jumping around stuff, so... I, I, look, if you got Nintendo, you ought to know what games you're going to be kind of games you're going to be getting. Yeah. You ought to know that by now. But, I mean, the Mario games are still solid. The problem is, I mean, I don't know. Like, I didn't like the last one, the Paper Mario. So, Mario, mm-hmm. I, loved, I loved it, like, for the first day, and then I hated it after that. <laughs> um, the problem with the Nintendo games is that I, I don't – they're the, the ones they have that aren't, like, Nintendo-only, Nintendo-exclusive. Right. They're better on my Xbox One. Yeah. So, that's true. That's a problem. But you know what's good news, though? Hmm. Um, uh, Overwatch is going to be cross-play now. Finally. We can play Overwatch online, and I don't have to buy it again. And I also picked up that volleyball game you talked about. I think we were off air, so. Yeah, Knockout City, huh? Yep, Knockout City. I got it and uh, played through the tutorial. It's actually really freaking fun. It's fun, and it's simple. Yeah, which I can appreciate. (laughs) I'm going to send you a crew invite, so. Yeah, man. (laughs) I will be there. And at the end of the show, anybody out there, we've got our um, all of our handles. We'll have our email and, and our Twitch handles. So if you want to play too, just let us know. We'll uh, streaming from Knockout City. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, let us know. Get our handles at the end of the show and um, send an email or, uh, or or a DM or something like that. And uh, well, Travis will hook it up because I, I don't really know how to do that. Apparently, I'm, I turn into an 80 year old man. But um, you, you've always been better at this stuff than me. <laughs> but let's not dwell on video games too much the way we always do. Uh, let's yep. talk about movies. We got a few. A few of them we're going to talk about this week. Uh, In the Heights came out this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're also going to talk about Infinite with Mark Wahlberg and Antoine Fuqua, which is out exclusively on Paramount Plus. And we're going to talk Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, which opens next week, but uh, uh, reviews are out now. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, we'll talk about that. Uh, so we're going to talk about those three movies today. Then we got some other news coming up after that. Um, so yeah, so which one do you want to start with? Do you want to start with it with uh, in the Heights, which uh, did not do well at the box office this weekend. Well, that's actually, you know, before we even jump into the reviews, um, you know, after last weekend, um, it looked like the last two weekends even, really, the box office was starting to come back strong. And then this is the first weekend where we really had two potentially big movies, uh, In in the Heights and Peter Rabbit 2, uh, coming out and... None of us saw. They, but, I, I, well, yeah. Apparently nobody else did either because they both underperformed. I didn't see the first one, so I wasn't going to go see the second one either. So, I mean. Right. I mean, so you looking at it, it's like, oh, well, maybe it was just a flash in the pan. But I think the bigger thing on there is confirmation of what we all already thought with these dual release formats was coming out in, you know, Disney Plus, HBO Max, and theaters. Only the movies that you would need to see in the theater are you going to see. That's most likely why Into the Heist didn't do that well. I mean, the hype on Hamilton's still out there, and it's, but it's not something you really need to see on a big screen. It's on HBO Max. Yeah, you know? That's probably the thing that's hurting in the Heights. Um, I think by now, I mean, I know I've probably talked about in the Heights enough, either on the site or even mentioning it in here. Mm-hmm. You know, I absolutely loved it. And yeah. the reviews for it have been absolutely amazing. Um, a cinema score, you've seen the raves all over online and, and, and TV and stuff and so forth. So most people know. Uh, right. It was, it was a really good movie. But, um, but. Is it the kind of movie that you feel like you need to go to a theater to see? Now, personally, I've, seen, I've screened it in the theater. 
I I think it's a million times better in a theater. I, and I think it is something that you would want to see in a theater. But it hasn't exactly been promoted that way. Mm-hmm. And and um, I think they haven't done such a great job of like TV promos have not been great for it. So, so I watched it on HBO Max, and that that kind of surprised me. But what you know, usually it's it's big special effects uh, or a horror movie, the audience reaction type thing. But sound, so what it, what is it about this that made it better color, in theater? Sound, color, energy, all that stuff is better all, for a movie yeah. like that, which is very energetic. I think it's uh, it's got a lot of great music and vibrant colors all over the place. It's just a million times better in the theater than it is on on a, on a TV. Yeah. Film. I mean, it's everything you know about Latin culture patched into, you know, 90 minutes. So, you know, energetic, vibrant, musical. Did we have Angela come here and do the review then? Uh, Probably should have, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, that's what I've always, uh, you know, what Travis referring to as my wife's Puerto Rican. But what I've always loved about the things that she's introduced me to is what it shows in this movie is it's everything seems like a, a little bit happier. There's a little bit more energy in every celebration. Did she watch it with you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she, well, she loved it. But, you know, she also, and, and if you ever wonder about why rep- representation matters, she loves anytime she sees a Puerto Rican person on a movie or TV, uh, she automatically loves a movie because, you know, you don't see it as much as you could. Um, but, you know, she was she was in the bag for it. And I kind of was too. I mean, we're both huge Hamilton fans. Um, even my kids know all the songs. You say you're both Puerto Rican, which I was going to be like, now that's the brother. <laughs> No, no, uh, Irish burn in the sun right here. But, um, yeah, no, I, you know, big, big fans of Hamilton, obviously, Lin-Manuel Miranda, um, you know, wrote the, the movie and the songs. Um, and I was, I mean, you know, like I said, we were in the bag for it, but I didn't expect it to be. I mean, I, I see, now you said that, and then you didn't even mention John Chu. Well, it was, what, but John Chu, you know. I'm fine with John Chu. I think he's, I liked his G.I. Okay. Joe. Crazy Rich Asians was good, but he's not a game changer for me. Okay, but John M. Chu, whether he's not a game changer for you, he's a game changer for a certain kind of movie. I mean, this is a guy who did the Step Up movies and made them look great. No, I mean, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah, he's, he, I, I always forget he did the Step Up movies. Right, it's probably the reason why he's doing this movie more so than for anything else he's ever done. He's certainly not doing it because he did G.I. Joe Retaliation. Why, well, yeah. <laughs> and, and you could probably say he's doing it because of Crazy Rich Asians. Right. I would say without Crazy Rich Asians, he's probably not doing this movie at all. Mm-hmm. I found somebody of Latin, of Latin heritage to, to do it, probably. Which was funny that they didn't. It is a little interesting, and I've heard a lot of a lot of uh, complaining about that on Twitter. Mm-hmm. A, a person of Latinx um, culture to do it, um, but uh, honestly, I think yeah, I think you go with the guy who's, who's got the experience and the guy who makes this kind of, who makes this kind of movie pop. And if Lin Manuel Miranda was fine with it, then I'm fine with it. Yeah, I mean that's that's the goal, right? The best best man or woman for the job. Um, I think he's the best possible director for it, honestly. His mm-hmm. his choreography is incredible, um, and it's incredible in this movie as well. I was having a ball watching it. Oh, I was smiling the entire time. I loved every single character in it. And that's very rare. Uh, and this movie also helped win me over for Anthony Ramos, who's an actor I've never really gotten into like that. And I've seen him in some really. Movies. I never have. I've, okay. I, I've seen him do these monsters and men, and of course, um, Stars Born, and so forth and so forth. But uh, I never really, got, really, really dug him as a leading man until until this movie. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, Hamilton, the Hamilton alums are all kind of they take time for me. Like I wasn't into Debbie Diggs until Blind Spotting either. So now, was the first place you saw them? First place you noticed them in Hamilton, or or elsewhere? Uh, I don't remember honestly. Because Ant- uh, Anthony Ramos and David Diggs specifically are the two that jumped off the screen the most when I saw Hamilton. Obviously, screen I didn't see the stage production, but those two jumped off, and I was immediate fans of both of them because they're so awesome in that in that play. Um, and he was Ramos really, obviously the the subject matter was going to pull us in as a family anyway. But Ramos was one of my main draws to it. I just I think he's you know kind of electric. He's he's really he can carry it. He's he's a great actor. Who's probably got a lot more film work in his future, but, um, you know, holding the whole thing, it's really easy to pop. Well, it's not easy to pop. It's easy to do well in an ensemble that's all good. Everybody's everybody's on the top of their game, but 
you know, and this was an ensemble, don't get me wrong, but he was the main character. I think he held it well. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, I like the entire cast from the top to bottom, so. You know, uh, Jimmy Smith's had to audition for this. Doesn't that seem weird? No. It's Jimmy Smith's. I, I mean, know who he is. I know who Jimmy Smith is. It's Bobby Simone, man. It's from the NYPD Blue. I know who yeah. Jimmy Smith is. Well, I know. I'm just saying, but it's, it's like, Jimmy, you don't ask Jimmy Smith to audition. I mean, especially if you're making uh, a movie about um, a Hispanic New York neighborhood. I mean, that's like... What he, you're saying is you could just get any any Hispanic. Dude. No, I'm saying you get Jimmy Smith is the Hispanic you get for that one. Because, <laughs> he, I mean, he's been doing... He's, he's been a trailblazer for them, okay. you know? Look, I know that, but it's still a role that requires a certain... Like, him to do certain things. Like, if it was just acting, then okay. Fair mm-hmm. enough. But then you probably don't. I mean, he but, is Dale Organa, but whatever. <laughs> he is Dale Organa. That is. Yeah. Um, I mean, but it, this requires a little bit more than just acting. It requires a lot of singing, a little bit of dancing, a little bit of all that stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you can make more dishes. It's not bad. You know, he got it, so obviously he did fine. So, okay. <laughs> I just a neat little trivia point I, I thought was funny. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I, I mean, the the thing I liked about it the most, honestly, is yeah, that... Like Eugenio Derbez or something, then you'd be like, what the fuck? So, yeah, fair enough. Um, is you know every movie's got to have that structure where it's you know building up, everything looks great, something bad happens, hero fixes it, gets better, credits. But this you know this did have drama to it. You know there were there were there were points here and there, but more than anything else, it was just a celebration end to end. It was it was it was joyful and happy, and I think that's something that. That's the reason you go to the theaters to see this. Um, now, not having seen it in the theaters, I'm being a hypocrite here, but that's the reason you go to see it. After the year everybody's had to be in a, a room full of vaccinated people and watch a joyous type movie like this, that's what the movies were made for. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little bit bittersweet at times, too. It deals with gentrification and also immigration. and it, it deals with a lot of really serious topics, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it has a lot of stuff going on here. Um, but mainly, yeah, this movie is is a, a tribute in a lot of in a lot of ways to neighborhoods like Washington Heights, which mm-hmm. in a lot of things in some cases are disappearing around this around this country. So uh yeah, I mean I look I, like I said, like I've said a million times before, as soon as it was over I wanted them to start re- restart it and I would have sat there and watched it again. So Right. Uh, um, it's on HBO Max now. Uh, I'm actually surprised it doesn't play in this house more often, surprisingly. Considering the, the other the, the other person who lives in here with me, um, yeah, so I'm surprised. Nice. It's a it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic film. I hope people I, look. If it's not going to do well at the box office, that's you know that's disappointing. Of course, mm-hmm. I haven't done the box office rundown on the site yet. I'll get to it probably after this show. But but if it's not going to do well there, at least I know people are going to watch it at home on HBO Max and they're and they're going to love it. So. Yeah, I mean, and obviously Into the Heights isn't a movie that's made to be sequelized, but I, I am curious to see how in the studio is already in the works. You know that was that In the Heights Two is already in the works. No, I missed it. I didn't know that. Well, generally musicals aren't okay. Well, so then, I'm, then I'm wrong. Then, then my 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 question is even more relevant. Uh, I'm really curious to see how. Oh, okay. Well, see, you messed with me because I can't pay attention to everything. And you if know you everything. Read this site, you would know there is no In the Heights sequel coming you, up. You post that. You put up 87 articles a day. No, you I can't don't. read them all. I, like, yeah, I, like eight. <laughs> <laughs> I try. I try. Um, but look, you know, okay, so it's made to be sequelized. My question is, and I know they'll never reveal it because apparently how you calculate um, the earnings, I guess you'll call it, of any movie on a streaming network is a highly classified secret for some reason, but I am curious to see. These movies that they do release, um, you know, if it doesn't do well in the box office, but they it did well on the streaming service, you know, historically it's been if it does well in the box office, you'll get a sequel. I'm curious to see how how this affects that, to see if they're still going to rely on the box office or not. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know how it's going to work. I think they just got it, 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 <laughs> Warner Brothers made this this blanket decision to release these movies in theaters and in, in HBO Max, they probably bet should have been more selective. Yeah. They probably should have been more selective about the way they did it. Um, it it's as simple as that. A, a movie like Godzilla vs. Kong or Mortal Kombat, people are going to go into the theaters to pay to see those. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like, like a like this. You could put it in theaters. Maybe you charge five bucks to show it at home or, or something. I don't know. Or maybe you just make it. Or maybe you just make it theaters exclusive. Mm-hmm. But they probably should have adjusted all of this by now. And and rather than making that blanket statement, now I know when they made that blanket decision, the situation in the country was a little bit different. Yeah. I mean, we weren't we weren't nearly as vaccinated as we are now. But there's nothing that says they can't make that <laughs> reverse that decision. In fact, I'm sure most most uh, most directors would be would welcome the decision to have most to have their films shown exclusively in theaters. Oh, I agree, but I but I do disagree with with that being not something that they can reverse because I think that's kind of statement. That once you make it public, you, you're stuck with it because you don't want every subscriber that that's been on you because even if that's not the reason that you signed up. Every single person that subscribed be like, what? You promised this, and I sc- signed up for it, and I'm canceling. It'd be a big scandal. Maybe, but we're also in, in an unprecedented situation here, and so fluidity, I think, is understandable. People, I mean, studios have been changing and reversing their decisions on shit for a year and a half now. But I mean, not when people times, think they're getting something for free. <laughs> how, many times is, how many times have movies swapped over and over again, like swapped dates? How many times has have uh, Warner Brothers or Paramount or any of these places waffled on whether or not movies are coming streaming or if they're coming in theaters. I mean, this stuff's been happening off and on because nobody's understood what, how things are going to be the very next day. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I agree that they should be able to, but the difference is people are now thinking they're going to get something for free. And I just think they'd freak out. You know, that seems to be the way we go. Um, one movie that's not free. I think that'd be a very small amount of people who are like, I, I purchased, HBO Max for seven bucks, um, <laughs> you know, because I thought I was going to get in the Heights, right? Exclusive to theaters, really? I mean, I mean, maybe that's that they'll happens. They'll say it; it won't be true, but they'll maybe say it. It happened for a few people, but and I guarantee you, anybody that gets HBO Max or something like that for a movie that's coming up is going mm. to wait until that movie is about to open before they get it. They're not going to get it months in advance. Because that would be that would defeat the purpose of why you're getting it. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think there's anybody that would actually make that case. I think the students are just they're just kind of I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. They're just they're probably still trying to get their heads on straight. But yeah. one movie that was not streaming um, was the Hitman's Wife, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, Ooh, we'll be talking about that next. Okay. Yeah, you'll be able to see that in theaters this coming Friday. Um, we'll do Infinite next. So that's okay. Let's oh. talk. To- no, 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 let's let's do infinite. No, 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 no. You already started. Don't backtrack now. Well, now I changed the scene, so we're on infinite now. <laughs> I'm surprised by the order. That's all. So you okay. Can play bodyguard. It's fine. Um. Well, we're on. I, I changed the scene. I'm not gonna change it back. So I'll I'll make people have uh, epileptic seizures if I just keep changing it. Um. Did you have? Do you have? Now we're, talking, now we're talking infinite. We're talking infinite. Yes. Um. I need to get you a, a preview screen over there so you can see what I see. Um. Did um, what was I gonna say? Do you have Paramount Plus or CBS All Access, whatever they're calling it? No, I don't. I don't. I, I don't. I, I can't find any reason to get it. I don't like Star Trek, so I can't find a reason to get it. Yeah, and I mean, I, they I, do I, have a bunch of good stuff on there, but it's nothing that pops out. Um, and, you know, it's like old TV shows that you would watch if you had the service, but nothing you'd get the service for. Yeah, um, it, none of that stuff would appeal to me. I wouldn't watch any of it. Like, I don't watch old episodes of anything now unless it's Seinfeld. So mm-hmm. I don't watch, I don't need <laughs> Paramount Plus for that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, there's no reason for me to get it. And then Infinite would not have been something to make me get it either. Um, and look, I don't think the movie is awful, but it don't make no sense. Uh, so That's that. the biggest problem, yeah. <laughs> Infinite was going to come out in theaters. Um, yeah. But it sold to Paramount or CBS Viacom, whatever, and they put this as you make a Paramount Plus exclusive. So you can't even see it in theaters. You can only see it um, on Paramount Plus. And they did this for a specific reason, because they really don't have any blockbusters mm-hmm. um, on the on the site, on, on the streaming network, like unlike Netflix and, and Apple and, and Amazon have blockbusters coming out all the time. Paramount Plus doesn't, and this is their way of trying to attract people to the service. So the film is directed by Antoine Fuqua and Mark Wahlberg. Quick, what was the one time, one movie they did together before this? Uh, well, uh, no clue. The only movie that came to mind was um, uh, 
training day. And I know, I know, uh, he wasn't in that. No, well, what, it, it was shooter. They did shooter. Shooter. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, for the, the one and only time they had teamed up before this, this is their second collaboration. Mm. Um, and infinite, it's kind of like Highlander meets like the old guard kind of. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically Mark Wahlberg who, let's face it, Mark Wahlberg, he he never can play a guy who's who's not tough in some kind of way. Like every single movie he does. And when like, he tries, it's so horribly stupid. Just watch The Happening yeah, or something like that. In this, like there's, there were a couple times where he showed like brief moments of vulnerability, mm-hmm. but not often. And in this movie, it's kind of funny the way his character just is uh, immediately leaps into whatever this crazy world is that he's in. Yeah, uh, he, he plays a guy who's who has flashes of memory from lives he never lived and he has all these skills that he never really trained for like he could fight he can creak and he can uh he can he can forge a japanese sword like a like 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 fucking hattori hanzo or something uh he can he can do all these things that he never never really trained himself to do and he knows all these things that he never thought he'd do he's like a walking encyclopedia right um he comes to learn that he's part of this this group of people called infinites who um, maintain all of the knowledge that they've gained from past lives. And so basically it's a movie about reincarnation, mm-hmm. reincarnated over and over and over again. Um, so he's part of this group of people. Um, he thought he was schizophrenic. The world thought he was schizophrenic, but he's not. And this is what his issue was. Uh, he finds out there's another guy out there played by Chiwetel Ejiofor who was uh, slowly being pigeonholed into this type of smarmy, pompous villain role. Um, a guy who's trying to wipe out all of the infinites. So he's trying to destroy them. Mm. It really was quite clear as to why he wanted to do that, considering he is one. Um, I, you know, he just, I guess he got tired of the whole reincarnation thing. It was just really kind of stupid. It didn't really make any sense. But whatever. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like a, there can be only one scenario, except there's going to be none. Right. Uh, he's trying to wipe them all out. <laughs> so Wahlberg and his, his, his team that he's with, set out to stop uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor's character before he can destroy everything. Oh, his name is Bathurst, by the way. So, yeah. Uh, his name is Bathurst. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and Dylan O'Brien factors in as well as, as an old friend of Bathurst's. Uh, he's also, I guess, the guy who Mark Wahlberg's character was in a previous life, although that on that stuff really made much sense to me either. It, they both felt very contemporary, like they were within days of each other, but they're not somehow. Yeah. That, it, it, that wasn't really spelled out as well as it should have been. Um, he holds some big secret, you know, within him as well. So that Bathurst is trying to find that Bathurst. I don't know. It's horrible. Um, but anyway, yeah, this, this movie is kind of a mess. Uh, like I said, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If you think about it too much, it's it's really really stupid. Mm-hmm. Um, but Antoine Fuqua is such a propulsive filmmaker that I kind of enjoyed watching it anyway. Um, mm-hmm. Some of the acting is pretty good. The car, I thought Fuqua's car chase scenes, which there are a couple in this movie, were excellent. Um, like those are the best parts to me. Um, well, Walt Burr's character, like I said, he's kind of ridiculous. Uh, he goes, like I said, he goes from from this regular guy who can't get a job, mm-hmm. finding out he's part of this, he, he's part of this basically immortal group, and he doesn't go through like the typical period of like adjustment where you're like what the hell is happening to me reincarnation's real you know <laughs> what the hell is he's just there he's just yeah. in it and it's just like oh and, and he's just and it's like he can't have he is he's mark Wahlberg, so he can't even have like that five minutes of like i don't understand what's happening to me type, type of bullshit and it's right. just like oh man it's just <laughs> it's just mark Wahlberg for you but if you can look past that the movie's quite entertaining in turn at an action level mm-hmm. and that's really about as far as it goes for me. But beyond that, it's pretty dumb. And that's, I mean, I'm on the exact same page, but that's why it surprised me so much that this was the movie they chose to stream. Because I agree completely with what you're saying, and I can see that logic. You know, they don't have any blockbusters there. But this is like a textbook dumb summer blockbuster. You know, it's fun to watch. There's, there's, it's there's. bombed at the box office, by the way. I think it would have. I think this would have bombed at the box office. If it had come out in the theater, I think it would have done poorly. Yeah. I don't think Wal- Wahlberg's not really a draw anymore, and I, I think the movie's almost too stupid. 
Uh, yeah. I think, I think it would have gotten horrible reviews and it wouldn't have done well. That's, but then that's, again, some movies like San Andreas, uh, you know, made a hundred million and, and those movies have the rock. And, oh yeah, I yeah, yeah. I guess Mark Wahlberg's about ten years past that, but and, and, and people can understand a giant earthquake more than they can figure out some weird reincarnation mumbo jumbo. Yeah, movie would have had to try to explain if it was in a doc, like in a theater. Yeah, they didn't really have to try to explain any of that because it was on Paramount Plus, and they didn't do a good job of trying to. Either. Well, they, didn't. they didn't try at all. It seemed. I mean, I, I <laughs> my impression of why he didn't question anything uh, and went right into life was because they were like, we don't feel like. You know, going then, then we'll have to answer questions if we have to explain any of this stuff. Um, you know, things blow up good. Uh, Anton That's Fuqua. The That's the other thing. I'm sorry. I, I don't Are you good? You're good. That's the other thing. Um, they did this huge exposition dump right at the beginning of the movie where they basically explained the entire movie to you, like right in the beginning. If you have to do so that, they, red flag. So that they don't have to have those beats in the story where he's trying to figure stuff out. They just and it's him. It's his character too that does it. Yeah. So he, so he just dumps it all right on you, and it's already like buried in mud before before it even gets started. It, yeah. it takes Fuqua a while to like dig it out of there and like get things going again. Yeah. But right, it's like right in the beginning. It's like. Boom, it's like here's all here's everything that's gonna happen and why it's happening right here right now. So you already know everything basically. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I mean, and look, you know, you when it comes to time travel and reincarnation and this kind of thing, we don't expect you to, you know, give us a scientifically logical explanation for anything. You know, look at Avengers Endgame even poked fun of it. Uh, you know, was this like Back to the Future? Is this like Terminator? And it. it you don't need to explain it logically, but you do need to at least offer some kind of plausible outline of something going on. Otherwise, you might as well just be putting whatever on the screen you want to. Um, you know, Mark Wahlberg is like 55 years old now or something, probably. Um, and he's he's still pretty impressive as an action hero. can't be that old. I mean, I want to feel bad if he's only 10 years old. He's got to be 20 years older than me. can't be that old. Well, we're going to have to consult the internet. I, yeah, 55 might be a little bit old, but he's 50. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm going to say he's 50. Um, IMDb, by the way, knows when uh, when we're doing the show, because at that point Mark is when Wahlberg. it always wants to slow down. Mark Wahlberg is exactly 50. Or 1971. Yeah, so for 50, I mean, I'm I'm 39, and I can't get out of bed without without moaning in ag- agony, so. The best shape of his life. I mean, yeah. he's, he's, I mean, there's no, I, nobody's doubting his cred as a, as an action star or the physicality he brings to the role, I'm mm-hmm. just, I'm just knocking the character and, and oh absolutely and and the the disappointing thing is Anton Fuqua because if you look at his his resume he does movies that are really well done both in action and in story, but then he also does movies that are just action. Um, you know, going all the way back to the replacement killers. Um, it, so it, it I don't know why he. I don't know if he's not trying as hard on some or like is a phoning it in thing because his action always looks good. But that's yeah, about all I, you're going to get out of this movie. I thought it was good in this movie as well. I'm not, I, I don't have any problem with Luke Wall. Mm-hmm. My problem is with, the, is with the screenplay. I mean, that, that's my biggest problem with it. And like I said, it's not even that big of a deal. Like I still give, would give this one a thumbs up for people to go and watch at home. Yeah. <laughs> I, if, it, if it was in a theater, I probably would have been like, you could probably wait for it. Um, but at home, yeah, this is perfectly fine to watch. And I think that's probably more of what Paramount's calculation was. They probably looked at it and they're like, yeah, this wouldn't be great in a theater. And it probably wouldn't. And it wouldn't be great in a theater. It'd be fine in a theater. But right. Yeah, at home, sitting on your couch, when you're on, you know, I think this movie is much better that way. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's going to be, you know, a Friday, Saturday night or Sunday afternoon, 90 minutes it's not something you're going to regret. You'll have fun watching it. Just yeah, your head might hurt a little bit at the end. If, you, if you're the kind of person that craves logic, stay away, but everybody else will be good. It's dumb. It wants there to be a sequel. I'm not so sure there mm-hmm. will be. But we'll see. You know, it's, 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 you know, it is what it is. It's fine. It's, Absolutely. It's, um, it's good for action, but not much else. <laughs> and speaking of movies like that, <laughs> that's why it's Bodyguard. There we um, go. Yeah, let's, let's, all right. Let's talk about this movie. This, this movie, I think, Movies like The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, which which opens, I believe, next Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I believe this kind of movie poses a conundrum for film critics. Why is that? 
because it is essentially the same movie as the one that came out in 2017. Like, it's basically the same. Mm-hmm. The only difference is there's a little bit more Salma Hayek. Or actually, there's a lot more Salma Hayek. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's basically, it's just the same movie. I, 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 was, I was thinking about this earlier, and I was like, it, The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard is what I would call a blockbuster burrito. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I know it sounds dumb, but the, but I, there, I have some th- some some logic to that. Some something behind that. No, I'm just curious. Is what's in the burrito? I'm waiting to hear. <laughs> well, I mean, well, think about what a burrito is. A burrito is 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 rice, meat, whatever, cheese, whatever you want in it. Right. And then you got this this stupid tortilla that you don't even really need. It's just basically a vessel for this other crap. Right. right? That's basically what it's there for. You don't need it. You just put it in a bowl. And it's, I think it's better that way. But you put it in the tortilla, the tortilla is just, just there to hold it in. It's just meatless. Right. And the plot of the Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard and the first movie is basically just a vessel for Samuel L. Jackson and Ryan Reynolds and I guess now Sam Hayek, Sam Hayek to drop the F bomb. Right. And blow stuff up. And that's and that's it. It's it's that's basically all it's there for. Because the plot in this movie is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen in my life. And I don't think I, I'm I I know Tom Tom O'Connor wrote it. Mm-hmm. It's like he wrote the first one. But I, I I'm willing, I if someone just came up to me and said yeah he didn't really write a script he just kind of sketched a couple outlines out and it's said, the elevator pitch and said, just, and said just go with it just wing it yeah I totally believe him. Oh yeah, because and the plot the plot the plot has Antonio Banderas is in it. Which, by the way, you're going to do a Desperado reunion between him and Salma Hayek. Can you mm-hmm. give it or something? Just something. Yeah. But anyway, but anyway, you, got, you can't do that and not wink at it, at least. I know. I know. I, I know. So, he's, he's, he's a guy who's basically, he wants to put Greece back on the map, basically. He wants to make Greece mm-hmm. a powerhouse again or something. So, he's like angry at the European markets or some dumb shit. It is the most absurd fucking plot. Has no no connection to any of the people that, that we care about in this movie. It is absolutely stupid. It is the dumbest thing, and they shouldn't even put it in there. But then they'd have even less reason for these people to be running around all these exotic lands, blowing stuff up and cussing each other out. And in the case of Salma Hayek, giving her breasts at people, you know, which hey, I'm not going to complain. No, I'm not complaining. Go with me. Any of her doing that, but. It, <laughs> This is one of the stupidest movies I've ever seen. And yet, it's hilarious. And I fucking loved it. Thing is... Because, and that's the conundrum. Because, it, like I said, it is essentially the exact same movie as the first one. It does exactly what the first movie did in the exact same way. And I don't think its ambitions go beyond that ever. And if they did ten of these movies, their ambition would never go beyond that ever. And so I- it gives the people what they were, what they are paying to see, exactly what they're paying to see, because they know mm-hmm. exactly what they're going to get, and it's successful in that. But if you're a critic who looks at it and you're like, well, they didn't attempt to do anything else, it's kind of the same movie, that causes a problem for you. What do you want to judge it for? But is <laughs> what, it- what do you want to judge it for? Yeah, <laughs> but see, I mean, I guess it all comes down to what what do you need to consider a movie successful? Like, it... Is a movie just supposed to entertain as its primary core function, and everything after that is just you know accoutrement? Um, because if so, I I I feel fine giving this like a positive review. But I get what you're saying. Like it, I mean it's it's junk food. I mean, like you said, the burrito analogy. I mean you can't have burritos for Thanksgiving dinner, um, but you know every once in a while burritos pretty damn good. And yeah, I could go to Ruth Chris and Chipotle, depending on my craving that day. Both would probably be just as good. But if somebody asks me, I'm going to tell them Ruth Chris is better than Chipotle because otherwise they'll look at me funny. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and look, I've seen plenty of critics who, who have trashed this movie for being exactly what it was in 2017. And I'm like, what did you think it was going to be? Yeah. I mean, I knew that's what it was going to be. As soon as they announced that they were doing a sequel, we knew what it was going to be. So yeah. Did you think they are going to get bigger and smarter? No. And, and- it's... If anything, it's a little bit dumber. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I actually did, did think it was a bit dumber. I, I mean, I thought they leaned into that, the. That, admit it, that plot is atrocious. No, it's 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 horrible. But you know, I, maybe it's me, but I've never really had a problem with that. If 
and, and usually it just applies to like horror movies, but you know, I don't, I don't have a problem with a shitty plot if everything else is done well enough to make me not care about the plot. Yeah. Because it's like you said, sometimes the plot's just a tortilla. And if the insides are good, that's all that matters. Um, you know, and it it definitely leaned into it. I think they might have been on the, with the Hitman's Bodyguard, they might have been on the fence about making a, a more serious action movie, but knowing they had to make a buddy comedy at the same time. But once they saw how well Reynolds and Samuel L. Jackson worked together, um, you know, they leaned into it. Or comedy than action, whereas the first one I think was more action than comedy. Right. Like a, there's a, like a little bit of reversal, and I think they're probably going to stay with this formula. <laughs> right. Because they're like, they hit on something really great with those two in that first one. And then mm-hmm. they they went into it all the way in this one. Yeah. You know, they'll just go further with whatever person they add to the movie, because you know they'll add one more person to the movie for the next one. So they'll probably like the hitman's bodyguard's girlfriend or the hitman's ex-wife's bodyguard. The hitman's bodyguard's like wife's mistress or mister, I guess. Because you know Ryan Reynolds needs a partner now, right? Like he needs a girl. Yep. Oh, he needs okay, a girl. I'm thinking Jason Statham, but okay. Um, I think that would be Charlize Theron because we haven't seen her do anything really funny, and that would be fun to see. You know, I think th- that would be a great choice if it were her. I think they'll probably go with somebody a little bit lower on the on the star wattage scale. Uh, <laughs> what they don't, they don't want their uh, their <laughs> cast salaries to be 150 million dollars, like, like Rachel McAdams. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, she's kind of the go-to for that kind of stuff. Rachel McAdams would be like the perfect one, right? Like yeah. The perfect person to be like that that fourth person. We know she can handle herself in both action and comedy. She's done action comedy before, right? So, and she's a big name. She'd be like the perfect choice. Yeah, she just she basically plays the same role she did for Doctor Strange, like in the in the hospital scene, but you stretch it out to the whole movie. I think it'd be more like her role in 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 a uh, game night. Oh shit! I forgot about that movie. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I can see that for sure. Something like that would be perfect for her. And she and she's and her and Ryan Reynolds seem like a couple. Like I, I, I could see them as a couple. You know, honestly, after seeing the um, like Michael Caine scene... would be like the resident old guy who's right, like, who's like either shady or or like a, a weapons dealer or something or whatever. Uh, <laughs> or both. And then in the fourth movie, <laughs> when they can't figure out how to beat the bad guy, bring in Danny Glover as the old wise person to tell him how to do it, and then you're good. But um. No, I shit. I just had something and I lost it completely. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it was. It's gone. It's gone. It's out of my head. Um, then we got a ton of news this week. Um, where do you want to start? So, 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 so where do we fall in this? So, so in the Heights, we both uh, really recommend. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I recommend Infinite a little bit more than you do. Uh, neither one of us thinks it's that great, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's fine to watch on if if you already have Paramount Plus. I mean, it, let's put it this way. Look at what Paramount Plus offers before you get the subscription just for Infinite, because Infinite's not enough to to subscribe. But if there's other stuff on there you like as well, it, it's not going to hurt you to watch. Right. And then we both recommend the Hitman's Life Bodyguard, even though it's dumb. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Emphatically, even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about what's going on in news. Yeah, we do got some stuff to talk about this week. Yeah. Got some big things. Um... Let's start off with the, at least the biggest to me, which was uh, the Motu trailer, uh, Masters of the Universe Re- Revelations, uh, the Kevin Smith um, show ran, or Kevin Smith led revival of the He-Man uh, cartoon that sold so many toys in the 80s. Um, I I was really hesitant about, I wasn't, he- He-Man wasn't the top of my list, it was like G.I. Joe when I was a kid, but then it was definitely He-Man right after that. Um, and I... Rumors. G.I. Joe, Mask, Thundercats, He-Man. You know what? And He-Man is lower on the list because I didn't even think about Thundercats. Put, and if you put Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they're somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And you know what? Mask, one of the most underrated 80s shows. Nobody talks about Mask, but Mask was amazing. It forever, and they just never seemed to do it. And it just never seemed to happen. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 ready for film. It's it's like the coolest thing. Uh, and that, that tractor trailer... Oh man, that toy! It was like the USS flag to me. You could, you were never, never getting it for Christmas, but it was awesome. Like the rhino? Was it called the rhino? Oh, it sounds right, but I'm not sure. Yeah. But um, you know, I, growing up in the in the '80s, um, I'm always a huge fan of that 
cheap sweatshop 2D animation style that um, that they all did in the 80s. Um, so much so that I, I always have a hard time getting into anime or like a lot of the revivals that happened in the last 10 years uh, that adapted like that anime style. I just couldn't get into it. Like Thundercats. You were series on, on Netflix. Was that? You were a cartoon that was on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think about that? I thought she was was all right. I actually watched it with my daughter. We sat down and watched watched the series, and it, it was it was good. It was definitely watchable. It was definitely fun. You like the animation in it, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, because that's and that's kind of what I was getting to here is that you've got that anime style like the new Thundercats did, which it's just too far to the anime side. Shira yeah. was a little bit closer to the stand, the I guess typical animation that I'm talking about, and He Man's another step closer to it. So you still have like the slickness of that anime style. Um, but they brought, I mean, the colors and the, everything's so vibrant in this trailer and, you know, a trick, if anybody ever wants me to get, wants to get me to like your movie or your show, Bonnie Tyler's holding out for a hero. Easiest way to get me there. I am brought back to the nineties. You know, you go and rent a tape from Blockbuster, a Fox tape. It was always Fox tapes. You pl- you pop it in the VCR and turn it on. First thing you see was an ad for all their action movies yeah. and the backtrack to it was holding out for a hero. So that's like a big nostalgia move for me. But the trailer itself was amazing. I mean, it, it, it really got me hyped for the show. Yeah, I'm excited for it. I mean, uh, it's always a, a chore to get me to sit down for any series at this point. Mm-hmm. But uh, but it looks, I think the animation looks fantastic. It looks like it's going to be, and I, when it was initially pitched, it was pitched as a continuation of the 83 cartoon, which is weird. Mm-hmm. But it was also pitched as an anime series, and I'm glad it looks like it's neither. Uh, it doesn't look like anime, and it doesn't look like it's a continuation of that. Um, it looks like it's going to have more action than the 80s cartoon did. It's just going to be a little bit skewed, a little bit more adult, which makes sense, because anybody who likes He-Man is an, is an old man now, mm-hmm. I guess. So uh, it's, I think it looks, it looks like it's going to be good, uh, and it's going to give me a chance to, to see more of Beastman, who is <laughs> one of the greatest villains of all time. One of the greatest doofus villains of all time. Yeah. <laughs> and it also had one of the greatest doofus sidekicks of all time with Orko. And Orko gets an... Orko a, an was a, not a doofus, though. Orko was smart. Orko was really smart. He's just not a powerhouse. He always seemed like... A, I, I mean, I, to doofus. be fair, I haven't watched the 83 cartoon in probably 20 years. Yeah. But I, for some reason in my head, I always remember Orko as being like kind of a... At least a klutz, if nothing else. Klutzy, yes. Like, think, think klutzy professorial. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, okay, so that's yeah, that's kind of what I what I mean. But even he gets an amazingly epic moment. Now, the only thing I'm concerned about at this point is that they just cut this trailer really, really well. Because I mean, there's some really epic moments in this. There's you know, beautiful animation. The voice cast is is ridiculous. I mean, you got everybody from Mark yeah, Hamill to Cersei Lannister. Yeah, the, the voice cast is crazy, man. Mm-hmm. I wish I had that list in front of me. The, the voice cast is tremendous. So the only thing I'm concerned about now is being let down when I see it, but I think it's going to be hard for me to do that, um, to be let down. Because what they're saying, uh, what, what Smith, Kevin Smith's saying at least, is that each episode is like an homage to a different thing about the 80s, um, you know, uh, which could go either way. Like if it's too heavy-handed, that could take you out of everything and just be like, oh, they're doing a Back to the Future episode or something like that. Right. All right, here's the cat. Here's the voice cat. Um, Mark Hamill is Skeletor. Sarah Michelle Geller as Tila, Chris Wood as He Man, Lena Headey as Evil Lynn. Love Evil Lynn. Uh, also in it is Justin Long, Stephen Root, Alicia Silverstone, Tony Todd, which is funny. Um, and of course, Kevin Smith couldn't do anything without putting his daughter in there. Holly Quinn Smith is in it too. Um, so yeah, it's pretty great. Rap. At it's least great. it's his daughter now and not his wife. Because at least it's his daughter now and his daughter is. is I, somewhat legitimate actress. So. Yeah, because I, I could, you know, all due respect, yeah. I could not stand her in any of the movies. She's just so annoying sounding and everything. Yeah, I mean, she's a leg- legitimate actress, thank Yeah. You. But, you know, whatever. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> someone's, not, <laughs> someone's not a fan of nepotism. <laughs> hey, look, if I were a director and I had a kid, there's no way in hell I wouldn't put my kid in my movies. Right. So, yeah, I don't yeah. blame him for it at all. Right, but it is one of those things that if you do it, you're going to get poked about it, and that's just the way it is. Right, exactly. exactly. Um, a lot more flack for it, from it, uh, for it from others than she'll ever hear from us. So. Right, for sure. <laughs> um, the first movie is Gilda Hosers. <laughs> oh, God. 
<laughs> Even I, as, as big of a Kevin Smith fan as I am, I'm more of a Kevin Smith podcast fan. I, I had that realization the other day. I was like, huge Kevin F Smith fan. I, I like Clerks, Clerks 2, Jane Silent Bob, all that stuff. But I realized I just I like his podcast more than anything else at this point. Um, we also got uh, confirmation, I guess. Jamila Jamil uh, joining She-Hulk. Now, yeah. am I crazy or did, did, did we talk about that a couple weeks ago that she was going to be on She-Hulk? Or was it just... It only had it only came out a few days ago, so I don't remember any, anything about that before. I could I, I remember her name and being associated with casting. Maybe it wasn't She Hulk, but I don't know what else that would have been about. But yeah, she's gonna play Titania, which is of course Titania had to be in the show. She's See now I don't know anything about She Hulk. Um, I know she's a lawyer. That's that's about it. Yeah, her based her her rival. So uh, it was it was no doubt that Titania was gonna be part of the show. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jamila Jamil is super funny. Obviously, she's from the people know her from the Good Place, uh, that game show she hosts, The Misery Index, I guess is what it's called, which I've never watched. Um, but it's perfect too because I think they're going to make this version of Titania kind of snooty. Mm -hmm. um, she's not a, not like her character at all, but um, I think that's the kind of do with her they're going to do with her, and that's perfect because that's what her role in the Good Place was. <laughs> yeah, so, stick to what you know. Yeah. yeah, that show's gonna be. I, I'm really looking forward to that one. Yeah, I think they're really gonna do like a Ally McBeal meets superheroes type thing. That shit could be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just I, I they seem to be doing a different angle for like none of all of the MCU shows so far seem at the same time familiar and totally different from each other. Like I don't know how they accomplish that, but it feels like they're in the same universe. But they also feel like totally different things, which is, you know, probably part of the appeal because, you know, people are totally different. So obviously all the heroes are going to be totally different and have different lives behind everything. But, um, you know, even Loki, uh, which which we talked about on last week's show, um, you know, has, has a different feel than anything else. I mean, it's kind of cosmic, but it's kind of not. And well, I mean, they're doing on TV what they don't really get to do on the big screen for the most part. One of the major complaints about the Marvel movies, and I've had that complaint too, is that they feel sort of homogenized. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're very formulaic. You can always kind of tell how they're going to end for the most part. The differences were, there are a couple of exceptions, of course. We talked about the couple of Cap movies with the Russos, and uh, I would say like Endgame and Infinity War felt a little, well, Endgame felt different. Mm -hmm. um, like Infinity War necessarily felt different. But you know, they they fall. They all follow so follow a certain pattern, right? Um, TV shows can break away from that in the ways that the big screen movies can't. So uh, I think that's what they're doing, and I like it. it it's it's good stuff. I'm all for it. You know, I don't I want Marvel to look different every single every single time they show us something. I want it to look a little bit different. Right. You know, I don't know if we said it on here or I heard it somewhere else, but the idea that moving forward. The TV shows are like the weeklies or the monthlies, and then the movies are like the annuals and comics. I'm, I'm totally for that. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no reason you can't do both, especially with the money they have to throw at it. The annuals typically were the shittiest comics of the year. So, I mean, so hopefully they ignore that part of it. <laughs> All um, right, my analogy kind of fell apart there. I mean, no, no, no. <laughs> if, it's not, if it's not your analogy, then it's not your fault. I mean, I'm just saying, like, if you're going to compare them to the annuals, the annuals were usually like, like a backup story that they're like, just like, let's just expand it and make it the annual. Right. You know? the, the stories generally suck. And there were some that were good over the years, but I don't remember annuals being terrible for the, for the most part. So, hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> also in Disney plus, uh, the Obi-Wan series. Now this, this struck me as at the same time, strange and completely expected is, uh, Liam Neeson sat down to an interview with some folks, and um, they were talking about uh, they were talking about the upcoming Obi Wan series and whether or not he'd be back as Qui Gon. Um, so obviously Neeson says, "No, I'm not going to be back. I haven't heard anything about it. They haven't asked me. But if they ask me, I'd love to do it." Which let's to me, be let's be honest, he's going to fucking be in it at some point. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, I, that's why I, the, reason, the reason why I was like, you know, I'm kind of like. I don't give a shit what Liam Neeson says about anything. Right. He will end up in it. <laughs> yeah. 
And but if they had asked, if they first of all, I think they've already told talked to him about it, and that he's already agreed to be in it. I think that's true. Mm-hmm. I think that's the case. But even if they haven't talked to him yet, they will call his ass like the week before the final episode of the season and be like, "Hey, you mind showing up as Qui Gon? It's just you know as a uh, you know." Uh, Force ghost or something, you know? The yeah. Last well, it's even easier than that because, um, as the Star Wars nerdery will tell you, Qui Gon was never able to turn into a ghost. Obi Wan and Yoda were the first ones to do that, so they only need yeah, a voiceover. That's true. That's they, true. And but, there's but, no but way. Was his voice heard at the end of, uh, was it? Rise of Skywalker? Yeah, he was one of the voices, which so didn't make any sense because he had no contact with Ray at all, but I guess if you're in the Force. So he eventually figured it out. Well, he could already. He he at the end of Revenge of the Sith, he was talking to Yoda because there's a scene at the end of Revenge of the Sith, Sith where um, Yoda tells Obi Wan, "I've been talking to Qui Gon. He reached me back from death. He says it like Yoda." Like half as Jedi can project his voice from beyond the grave, but can't come back as a Force ghost. Yeah, exactly. He's a he's half assed. Um, but I, it, <laughs> there's no way he doesn't show up because there. We with, knew he was half assed anyway by the way he got his ass beat. Yeah, yeah, and not even a good hit, just a little jab in the chest, and he's done. Um, which it's too bad nobody caught taught Obi Wan the move that Ray did on Kylo Ren and Rise of Skywalker when she just you know healed it. But I guess that's something you learn if you don't have any teachers. Um, but anyway, uh, it, it doesn't make sense for him not to be in it that's because that movie. <laughs> the uh, I mean the Obi Wan series. The biggest problem with it is. Historically, everybody has known that Obi-Wan didn't do anything during those 20 years. He, he watched over Luke's farmstead and maybe killed a couple uh, sand people um, during that time. So there's only one way I see this show happening, and I'm probably completely wrong, but the only way it makes sense is if they bookend each episode with him in, a, in his hut on Tatooine or whatever, or overlooking Luke's farm, you know, meditating and talking to Qui-Gon, and then the chunk of the episode in the middle is flashbacks with him and uh, Anakin in the Clone Wars because they brought Hayden Christensen. Nothing happened during that time. How do we know that? Is that? I mean, there's it's there's canon comics and stuff like that too, but I mean, it's it's always been because he's he's babysitting the whole time. He's watching Luke and Tatooine's kind of a a, a dashedly place, so he's you know because people. I will, are, I will guarantee you that is not how the story is going to be. Well, I mean, I, I I'm <laughs> interested to see whatever else anybody has. I mean, it could go wherever, but the, the thing is that. So the thing you can't explain then is Hayden Christensen's inclusion because he's credited as Darth Vader. I get that, but there's no way Disney pays to bring Hayden Christensen back if they could pay a stuntman half to do the same thing. They're not even using his voice if he's Vader. They're using James Earl Jones. There's no point in him wearing a suit that you can't see who it is and coming on set. So obviously he's going to be Obi Wan unless they totally break from everything we know and and Vader's not wearing a helmet. So it's flashbacks. Gotta be. I mean, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. What do you, what do you think? Is, I'm curious. What do you think it's going to be like? I think he's going to be running all over the goddamn planet fighting people. Yeah. <laughs> and they're going to be like, who said he didn't do anything during that time? That's bullshit. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the other side is, you know. They're against retconning. They just retconned a major scene in the very first episode of The Bad Batch. Yeah. So it's, not, it's not as if they're against retconning shit. No, that true enough, true enough. And, and, and honestly, it doesn't really make sense to me anyway that he would have been there all those years and, and didn't do nothing. Like like he literally didn't just sit sitting in his cave and look at his look out his, his binoculars every now and then to make sure, oh he's still alive, okay, that's, that's good. Uh yeah. no, I don't I don't I don't think that, that doesn't that doesn't compute for me. That doesn't make any sense. Well he's sitting there meditating, doing his Jedi thing, learning about learning how to become a force ghost. That's not something you learn overnight. It takes twenty nobody, years. Nobody wants to see that show. <laughs> I agree. That's why we have the flashbacks. Cross-legged, like, oh shit! You mean I can be a force ghost? Nobody wants to see that. Episode. Yeah. So. Well, you know, they they have done a lot with the Mandalorian and expanding Tatooine's criminal empire. So, I mean, the truth be told, you could stick to him staying on Tatooine and do what do what you're talking about as well, because and stay within canon. Because, like I mentioned, he would watch out for their farm and like when Tusken Raiders were com- would come or when Jabba the Hutt's gangsters would come and, like, take water during a drought or something, he'd you know fight them off and save everybody. You know they'll just say, yeah, it, it'll be similar to that. You know what they'll just say? They'll just, he, he didn't have any battles with the Empire, but didn't mm-hmm. mean he didn't have battles. Yeah, yeah, like, he didn't for have sure. Enemies. Like, there weren't, there, there were plenty of enemies around on that planet. 
Um, and we already know you had some because uh, in in Rebels, one of the episodes, or I'm sorry, not Rebels, was it Rebels? Yeah, Rebels. One of the episodes was all about Darth Maul finally getting killed by him on Tatooine. Right. So. So he got super duper. Yeah. So. And in another another story, just as high profile as Marvel and Disney Plus, Ted is becoming a series. Everybody's I favorite. Think that because just because I wanted your opinion. Was that I? Well, then just because I wanted your opinion on it. My opinion on it is I don't want to see anything uh, from Ted if it's not R-rated and it doesn't have Mark Wahlberg in it, too. Yeah, I mean... Even if it's a series. So there's a Ted a Ted series that's in the works from Seth MacFarlane. He's going to mm-hmm. come back as the voice of Ted, of course. Uh, the foul-mouthed, uh, oversexed teddy bear. From the, the, only thing I, the only thing I think of is R-rated Alf. That's the only thing I can think of if you make that TV show. Those two movies made like seven hundred and fifty million dollars combined. Oh yeah, no, there were no slouches, but like, there were diminishing returns. Ted Two was nowhere near as good as Ted One. No, definitely not. But it's, it's actually a little bit amazing that they didn't just do a third one, considering how successful they both were. Yeah, um, I'm actually surprised that they're going this route to do a series when they could have done a third movie. But then again, it's been a while. Yeah, but uh, still, uh, I don't know. I'm I'm surprised that they that he would do this. It does seem weird, especially because, well, I mean, I was going to say he he said before he doesn't like to do things for the money, but, I mean, you know, Family Guy's still on 47 seasons later. Uh, I mean, he's got more money than he's supposed to do with. I wish I, I wish he would... Orville coming back? That's what I want to know. That's what I was going to say, is, is, is I wish he would just focus on the Orville and move forward, because I don't know if we've talked about that on this show or not, but I like the Orville a lot. It was actually Orville. a really good show. great, man. It's yeah. great. I was, I was sad when it... Not ended during the second season or the second season, but moved. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. It seems like that show is going to be short lived. Um, yeah. After this, but I, I love that show. I've watched that a million times before I watch anything Star Trek that's not Next Generation or Deep Space Nine. Right. So. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. So Ted's becoming a, a, a series, and then the other thing that really kind of no Thunder know, Buddies, no Ted. No, yeah, no Thunder Buddies, no Ted. Um, but the other thing that kind of put a big question mark in my in my mind was, in 1994, Kingpin was a hilarious movie that people quoted and talked about for years and years. Um, and I, I, would, I would like to say, you know, a little um, backstage knowledge. Uh, before the show, you know, Travis will send me what the kind of things we want to talk about so I can get everything ready. And I totally just looked at the thing. I was like, I didn't see any Kingpin stories. So I went and got a picture of the Kingpin, you know, the Spider-Man villain, and got it all set up. You got a picture of Wilson Fisk? (laughs) Well, it didn't never cross my mind in a million years that, and I didn't, no, I didn't see it on the site. I must have missed that one, too. Um, It it never would have crossed my mind in a million years that we're talking about the Farley Brothers movie, which, hey, it was great in its time. The only Farley Brothers movie I like. Yeah, and it, I did, the only problem with it is it did kind of taint Lynn Shea for me for the rest of her career, uh, and I love Lynn Shea. Um, I actually, you know, when we, we did uh, a while back, and you guys can find it on one of the YouTube channels, we did a, uh, a screening and a and a with her, and sweetest lady, I'm sitting there talking to her, and all I can see is her going, ah, and I'm like, oh, can't do it. Damn you, Kingpin. Vanessa Angel, yay or nay? A hundred times yay. A hundred <laughs> times yay. Love Vanessa Angel. That uh, was a coming-to-age favorite of mine. Oh, yeah. Kingpin, I, I just think it's the most brilliant thing the Farley Brothers ever did. I never could get into, you know, the Dumb and Dumbers and uh, mm-hmm. me, myself and my, me, myself, and Irene. I think it's one of theirs, too. Um, I could, it, there's something about Mary. I couldn't get into those. I, I, I never could get into any of those. But Kingpin is perfect. And, and basically, it's a bowling movie, if you don't know. If you've never seen Kingpin, it's a bowling movie with mm-hmm. Woody Harrelson. Uh, Randy Quaid, Vanessa Angel, and Bill Murray. And it's like this traveling, it's kind of a road movie. Um, you know, where <laughs> uh, Woody Harrelson, I swear, Woody Harrelson is in every fucking movie. At some point, yeah. He's the white Samuel L. Jackson. I was thinking about the number of franchises he's been a part of Hunger Games, Star Wars. Star Wars. Is Planet he in Marvel? Of Planet of the Apes. Planet of the Apes, yep. Um, he hasn't shown up in Marvel though yet, has he? I mean, he's going to be in Venom. Oh, duh! Yeah, that's right. He's 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 in Carnage. Venom. Yeah, he's in every goddamn friend. He's everywhere. He's just in everything. Like even if you look back on like just his single movies, 
Fucking Woody Harrelson's everywhere. I mean, he's kind of but, that guy you can't not like. So <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous that he's just popular everywhere. But that, I think yeah. he's one of my favorite roles of his. And uh, he plays this this ex former bowler who got his arm put into the the ball return <laughs> every one of the match. <laughs> That might all, be the best aspect of the movie, by the way. He's all bitter and shit. I know he's got a hook for, for a hand, basically. He's, he's all bitter. Uh, he hooks up with Randy Quaid. It's Amish dude. Uh, who's like this bowling savant. And uh, they go on the road to kind of get revenge on the guy who... Uh, who Ernie <laughs> McCracken. Ernie McCracken, yep. Who, uh, big E, Ernie McCracken. Bigger Ernie McCracken. And uh, mm-hmm. he's rolling his arm to get revenge on him. And that's the angel kind of played by John Oldman, who played the Joy Spirit group. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the movie's just hilarious, man. I love for all love bowling, so uh, and bowling movies are great too, which is one of the reasons I like Joe Big Lebowski so much. But um, yeah, man, it's just it's just a great movie, and I, it doesn't, but it doesn't need a sequel or 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 or, or anything. It definitely doesn't need a sequel. Right? Well, when I think of a, 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 a sequel to a movie like this, I think of um, the Jesus Rolls. Yeah. And, yeah. Awful spinoff movie that John Turturro did a year or two ago that I watched and I was just like covering my eyes. It was so bad. Well, and they have something else in in common, and that's that you know the first Kingpin kind of lived and died on the relationship and the chemistry between Randy Quaid and Woody Harrelson. And unless something changed, uh, Randy Quaid is not exactly sane anymore yeah, uh, right. or able to be yeah, found he's for gone. work. Yeah, he's he's he's, he's gone off the deep end. Uh, yeah. But there's nothing that says all those people are coming back either. So, I mean, who knows? This could be something else entirely. Well, then it uh, begs to answer the question, why bother, you know? Well, I think that's the question anyway. Yeah. Why bother? Because it's not – Kingpin wasn't a hit back then at all. Right. And in terms of Fairly Brothers canon, it's kind of like the forgotten movie because um, it's not Dumb and Dumber. It's not It's not anything like the movies that are on – like. The, it's not even Shallow How. Mm-hmm. Like in terms of like Fairly Brothers – "Quote unquote cult classics," it doesn't register for most people. In fact, most people didn't even see that one compared to all their gigantic hits. Mm-hmm. It's like the lost film for them. So it's like, who's the audience for? Like, I don't know who this is for. Like, is it for me? Like, you're making it for me. That's fine, you know. But if you, but there's no one else out there that's like aching for Kingpin, anything, not a sequel, not a spinoff, nothing. Well, this is what scares me about about you know the golden age of TV that we're in is that. With so many streaming giants, there's so much content needed. So anything that has any kind of audience, especially stuff that had smaller, feverish audiences, like all the cult stuff, is going to get remade. Um, and, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead sooner or later because tr- the streaming collapse is coming where, uh, you know, we're going to have two or three that are a little bit more expensive and everything, everything else is going to go away because th- it can't sustain sustain like this. So... You know, this might be the sign of that coming a little sooner rather than later when you start seeing things like Kingpin made into a TV show, um, and you really ask yourself, why would that happen? Yeah, it, it definitely does not need to happen. Yeah, and, I, and this comes from someone who loves Kingpin to death. Uh, it doesn't need to happen. In fact, I think I would do Kingpin today on my 365 days of film list that I've been posting all year. <laughs> <laughs> I need one for today. I think it'll be Kingpin. There you go. <laughs> Uh, so, um, like we said, uh, Hitman's Wife Bodyguard comes out on Wednesday, June sixteenth. So you guys can check that out then. Uh, next week, reviews up now. So our review is up now. Yep, reviews up now. Uh, next week we got you know Fatherhood um, is coming out. Luca on right, Disney Plus. Next week too. Yep. That's another one on me then. So. Uh, and that's that. Not much else uh, until F nine, uh, Fast and Furious nine on, on June twenty fifth, the following Friday. So. Uh, you can check out the you can check out the review um, for the Hitman's Wife bodyguards as well as everything else we wrote about today and everything else that came out, uh, all the news stories, all the trailers, everything's right there on the site www.punchtrumpcritics.com. Uh, make sure you're following us on Twitter to get all these updates directly to you as soon as they come out. Uh, the site is at PDC Movies. Travis is at Punchy Critic, and I am at Punch Drunk John. Uh, Twitch, uh, we said for a while, big things coming. I think we're finally rounding that corner. Uh, we might even add a second Twitch handle to this listing pretty soon. Uh, Travis is at cinematic underscore enforcer, and I am at going to have to do that soon. Um, no, that's that's not really. I, I just I have to get my Twitch handle soon. So uh, we're going to be looking at that to do some uh, some fun things and uh, some interactive things with the audience. Um, you know, 
get you guys involved a bit. Uh, if you have any tips, questions, um, if you if you want to join us playing some games, if you if you want to tell us how much we suck, whatever you want to do, info at punchdrunkcritics.com is the email address. Uh, just shoot us an email. We'll make sure to get back to you. Um, and that's all I have. So, yeah. um, you got any? Yeah. Oh, so what else is? Uh, look out for some interviews. We got some big interviews coming up in the next few days too. Um, I know I talked to this to Vanessa Shaw for 12, uh, 12 Mighty Orphans that comes out this week. Love her. Uh, yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, I got to talk Ladybugs with her. That's what I did. <laughs> nice. Uh, her first her first movie. Uh, so that interview will be up this week. Um, we got interviews for the Tomorrow War coming up as well. Chris Pratt and some other people. Uh, we got that. We got a bunch of stuff. And uh, I'm doing my first review for RogerEbert.com this week. Nice. They seem to pull a lot from DC. Well, I mean, half the people who've written for us in the past have written for them, so. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, that's that's where our, our good friend, uh, the movie mom, Nell Minow, writes primarily, isn't it? Other than her own place. Our, our our friend Rocky has written for them multiple times. They they asked me to write it, write something, so I did that. Um, nice. A couple other times. Uh, I don't know if I'll do it again. You know, you know me. I'm not really a pay for play kind of guy when it comes to writing stuff. Right. Unless it's Joe Blow and I'm doing videos. But uh, they asked me nicely. Uh, and so I'm going to do that. So that's that's done. It should be out this week. So check, uh, so look at RogerEbert.com for uh, for Travis's feature there. Yeah. So a lot of stuff this week. A um, bunch of reviews next week as well. So, And I, I guess I don't have to do fatherhood. I think Kobo's going fatherhood. They sent me the screener. Now I need to make sure he got one too. So I need to do that as soon as this is done. <laughs> if he didn't get it, then I'm, I'm not going to write it. I got enough shit to do. Right. All right, folks. Until next week, I'm John. And I'm Travis. This is Cinema Royale, and we are out of here. Later. Thanks for checking out the show. If you like what we're laying down, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest stuff.